you see me, okay? Uh -huh. Oh, I need to. Let's see if people are people are coming in. Let's see. Kate Blue Art, Christine Bowman Art, welcome. Andrew Cook is here. Andrew! Yay, Jim Hans, Linda oh, Castillo. Jim. Oh, people are just rolling in. All right. Erica's here. Bonjour, Erica. I'm, I'm trying to get in myself. I'm, I'm trying to see how, uh, where do I go? <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's all good. I don't know why it got me here. Ah, voila. Yeah. All right. There you go. Alexandra from Portugal's here. Oh, Alexandra is our biggest fan. Ah, Alexandra. Donna Fenstermaker. Our... Alexandra is our ambassador in Portugal. That's right. Uh, oh, there's Jimbo Alley. Ooh. Another Cindy. You have competition. All right. Diane Park. Diane oh my Park. God, people are coming. Come Hello in, come from in. Florida. Welcome. Welcome. All right. Very so nice. Should I put my mask, my go paint mask or not? <laughs> yes. Always a good idea to have your mask on. Have my mask. Uh, New Orleans. Welcome. How's the weather over there? Philadelphia. All over. Yeah. Val Valerie Collymore's here. Valerie. Valerie. Ah, you know, we're going to have to... Teach, or maybe she knows already. Valerie, we should get you to. I should get you some pastels. I would love to see your work with pastels. For sure, love the mask. Someone said, Rachel right. Ann from Detroit. Wow, we got one. Somebody from Japan. Woo! Wow. So maybe I should take my mask off. All right. And how about Mr. Jimmy? Has Jimmy showed up yet? Yes, he's here. All right. I'm so going to have to find him. I'm going to invite him in a minute. Let me do my start. Okay. I'll take my mask off now. Cindy is uh, distance enough. Cindy is yes. six feet away from me, I promise. I am. All right. So, you ready? Should we start? Yes. What time is it? It's On. 04. Okay. So, I think people should be in. So, one, two, three. Bonjour! This is Pierre at Savoir Faire, and here we are in uh, Novato, California, north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And it is eight months. Can you believe my first live, the first lockdown was in March? It's been eight months since we've been here every Friday celebrating the important of art, how through art we have been able to survive these crazy times. And every week we talk about different issues, you know, we've talked about, of course, the virus, the corona, you know, we talk about the injustice, now we talk about months. political, now in France there is a horrible thing, and what keeps us all together is the art. The art is essential. I remind you, when we got first locked down, we closed. Everything was closed. We didn't know. Maureen and I, Maureen, my wife, Maureen, and my partner, uh, we said, okay, can we go back? And we are starting to open our warehouse. And then soon I realized I got some calls from some artists, some stores, some doctors, some uh, teachers said, hey, we need, we need supplies, we need supplies. And I realized that it was essential. So I self-proclaim ourselves an essential business and waiting for the County of Marin to talk to us. But we succeeded. And every week we talk about why art is so important to our life, to the world. Not only that art is good for you, but art is good for the world. And you know, we talk about that uh, every week a little bit. We've had a lot of anecdotes, a lot of people giving artwork, giving art supplies, help the community, your friends, and, and there's so much to talk about. But today, I'm so excited to have my good friend, Jimmy! Jimmy! 
in is coming. So I, I think I'm going to cut my uh, little speech short because everybody's waiting to see our friend Jimmy. So uh, I don't know. We're trying to see how. He... Jimmy, Jimmy, come on. Come on. Yeah, I just sent a request to uh, to Jimmy. Okay. So I, uh, uh, you know, and if you cannot get in, maybe Andrew can call him or something. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There he is. Oh, you figured it out. Hi. He's so smart. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't see him yet because, you know, I have my iPad, but there's a delay, so it takes me a while. So, ah, here. Here we are, Monsieur Jimmy, bonjour. Bonjour, welcome to Manhattan. Okay. Oh. Welcome everybody, good to see you here. Yeah, and then, um, you know, I see on my thing, we don't, I don't see myself, but I think, oh, can you see me well? Yeah, oh yeah, you're a little cut off, but you can, yeah, just, yeah, move it, I can move it. Okay. So, no, no, but it's okay. It's okay. I, I just do it. It's a beautiful display. There you are. Can you see me better? Yep. Now? Here, you have no head. I have no head. That's the on my problem. screen, you have no head. Uh, really? Yeah. Well, on my iPad, I've got two images. Mine yeah, and Pierre. Mine stops here. Really? Yes. Okay, I'll hold on to oh. it. Ah, there we go. Much better. So here, I just want to welcome Cindy. Usually, she's in another part, and Andrew is holding the phone, and she thought she would be smarter than Andrew and have it on the holder. But no, it's you're true. Have to suffer holding the phone, <laughs> and we can see your rest. Okay. So, hey, thank you, uh, thank you, Cindy, and welcome, Jimmy. How are you, my friend? And thank you so much. Last minute, I told you a couple of days ago to say, hey, would you like to to come? And you didn't quite know what it would take, but you said yes, and here you are. So uh, it, it took a little uh, uh, technical maneuvering. I have a, um, what do you call it, a selfie stick that I never used, but my phone's too big for it. The phone kept popping out. So fortunately, I have a beautiful new iPad and a tripod for that. So, uh, wow, it's stationary. I had planned on walking you through the studio, but now we're stuck with one camera, and um, this is as good as I can do it. But uh, no, it's okay. It's all right. And if needs be, you can always take your camera and show us. But let's start for, for now. Let's let's begin. Well, Gary, yeah, I've lost your head again. <laughs> there we go. There we go. That's perfect. <laughs> so, um, well, I'm just sitting here with my catalog for the 48th PSA annual, uh, the, the uh, 2020 annual, which all of you can see online at the Pastel Society of America.org uh, website. And, you know, because of this pandemic, uh, this is the first time ever we didn't actually hang a show at the National Arts Club. Uh, but the advantage of having it online was I was able to, uh, the jurors were given permission to jury in more works. So it's actually one of the largest exhibitions we've had. And uh, so if you go online on the homepage, you can go directly to the uh, to the exhibition and see of all the entries, 1,400, more than 1,400 entries from actually from all over the world. Uh, you can see what our uh, jurors thought were the best uh, examples of contemporary pastel. And uh, then you can also see um, Marjorie Shelley, who uh, Pierre knows. Uh, she's the head conservator of paper at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art and a well-known scholar who writes on historic pastels, in particular 18th century pastels. And so Marjorie was the juror, single juror of awards and we gave away, we were just shy of $45,000 in awards this year. So uh, 
check it out and start planning your painting to enter in the 49th um, PSA annual, which will be in September 2021. Uh, Unfortunately, we can see the turn the pandemic is taking. I think once more, it will be an exhibition online, but the advantage for you is uh, you don't have to ship a painting. Uh, so anyway, we're we have a beautiful catalog, which you can see online as a PDF flip book, and you may also order a copy from Blurb. Uh, okay. And so behind me, you see my a little bit of my studio. Uh, I have the room divided sort of in half. This is the pastel half. And I'm sitting here actually facing uh, the half where I do oil painting. Um, um, so I'm somewhat organized. Um, and I'll give you... Okay, we'll give you two back. Jimmy, Jimmy, just one second. Yes. yes. Okay. So, first of all, thank you and great congratulations for the exhibition and all that. You said a couple of things uh, that I would like to come back to. So, for Marjorie Shelley. Yes. We, it, it is a good, good friend of mine. She actually wrote the forward of my book on saint Yeah. Yes. And I've known her for many, many years and she's a fantastic lady. Uh, with her, I've been able to visit the conservation department of the Met. I touched some pastel from Degas, things. It's crazy. Um, but we, we just posted it again. Jimmy and I had amazing pleasure to come together to give her, uh, for her collection, for the Met collection, an over 100 years old set of Senelier pastel. And it was just so fantastic. So we, uh, Marjorie, she's a very good lady and a very good supporter of all the pastels. So on that. So first of all, I just want to talk about you a little bit. Uh, okay. <laughs> you play the role, the president of PSA. But let's, I would like, you're not only the president of PSA. You know, I know you as an artist. You're an amazing artist. You have, in fact, you have a piece at the Whitney. You have, you, you're a New York fine artist, great artist. Thing. So, and you've been through, I don't want to go, go back to the 60s, 70s, 80s New York. You have such a rich, you know, uh, history of, being part of the New York scene, and you know you had you have or you had both uh, some such powerful, I mean, amazing uh, artist friends. So before and now, people in that crowd know you uh, for your position at the president of the Pastel Society, which is based at the National Arts Club. Which we can talk about it. It was my first connection with pastels almost 40 years ago. But can you tell us, before we talk about the Pastel Society and all that, can you talk to us a little bit about you? We want to know about you and how did you start the arts and tell us a little bit about your career as a New York artist. Well, I grew up on a farm in Western Kentucky, which uh, is in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's really uh, rural and uh, very removed from, uh, this is the 1940s and 1950s, uh, but I grew up in a family where both my mother and father uh, were college educated. My father was a farmer. Uh, my mother was a farmer's housewife. Uh, I grew up in a household that took Life magazine. So as soon as I was able to hold paper or hold a magazine, I was looking at all those great photographs in the, especially the 1950s uh, presented in Life magazine. So I grew up being very aware of Jackson Pollock, Frank Lloyd Wright, Picasso, Matisse, all presented to me in Life magazine. And I remember uh, a photo series of, uh, and Pierre knows the Riviera very well, as you can imagine. Uh, there was a photo essay on one of Picasso's 
home, homes near Nice, France. And maybe I was seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, but I knew immediately that's how I wanted to live. And that's, <laughs> and that's, that was, I was already uh, drawing uh, mm -hmm. and, and doing watercolors, but I grew up in a state where there was no, um, there was no arts program for students in public schools. Uh, but I had a wonderful indulgent aunt who bought me art books for Christmas. Um, and that was where all of this began. So I started school at the State University, uh, which was 40 miles from my home. And uh, that was 19, the fall of 1962. And um, I still have the letter from the Board of Regents awarding me a Regent scholarship, which paid half of my state tuition, which was very, my father was very impressed that I received that. Uh, I think I still have the letter. I think the total amount is $200, which meant tuition was $400. So, I keep part of my passion now for younger artists is is the burden they face of financing an education in the arts. Um, and that's another one of my passions is supporting uh, art schools and younger artists. That's mine too. That's yes. mine too. In fact, we talked about this, you know, during Above and Beyond, and I'm supporting your initiative, but I was talking about that also. We have been very aggressive in a nice way to be giving a lot of our supplies to community of uh, under service community, and especially kids with handicap or, or, you know, and give a lot of our supplies during the confinement. And I've gotten so much. Uh, Thanks. That saved their, uh, saved their life. Maybe it's strong, but when they were confined, art was a savior. Yes. And, and well, and and my passion with PSA. I now know so many adults who, as young adults going to college, uh, had to take practical courses to satisfy satisfy their families. So they became bankers and accountants. They became uh, parents who supported a family uh, with a husband who was professional, et cetera. So I'm now working with a lot of adults who have come back to their dream, that first dream, which was to be an artist. And uh, Pierre and I both know what that means to the soul and what that means to the spirit. And so, uh, I feel that art is for everyone. It's on very different levels. So I focus my entire life on this dream of being a, a professional artist um, and living like Matisse and Picasso in the south of France. I didn't make it to the south of France, but I did make it to New York. And when I moved to New York in 1974, uh, it was kind of like the Wild West. Uh, New York was on the brink of financial bankruptcy. Um, it was actually, I think, President Ford famously refused to bail out New York. And the uh, tabloid headline, you know, was Ford to New York City drop dead. Uh, so when I moved here, um, New York City was... Uh, like a frontier town in many respects. Uh, I, uh, and I started from scratch. I gave up a career teaching on uh, the act on the university level uh, just to live here. And actually it's being New York. I met someone and uh, who was my neighbor and two weeks later, uh, he hired me to work on a feature film, a non-union film, low-budget film. And so for three years, I supported myself doing non-union film work, doing uh, what they call set dressing, 
costumes, props, and that's where you go out and gather things and select items that go into a scene that help develop a character storyline. And then I discovered I intuitively was very good at, at um, creating storyboards. So I could take a script for a short commercial and lay out all the shots for the director and the cameraman. I made it all up myself, but it turned out I could create a filmatic narrative that um, uh, enhanced their production. Um, and uh, I moved to Brooklyn and very quickly realized I had made a mistake that everything I was interested in, all the art galleries were in Manhattan. So uh, after two years in Brooklyn, I moved to a loft on the Bowery and I actually moved into a loft that had belonged to, uh, you know, the, the actor Claire Danes. Uh, she wasn't born yet, but I moved into her parents' loft. <laughs> and uh, previous to that, a video artist by the name of Les Levine had occupied that artist. And I was down the street on the Bowery, um, four buildings away from a very famous modernist painter, Bryce Martin. Um, um, so I was living on the Bowery and these were all industrial spaces for light manufacturing. Uh, all that was leaving America for uh, Southeast Asia. And there was this huge change in terms of who occupied real estate in Manhattan. And immediately artists had moved into these spaces and uh, then Four years. So are you still in the seventies? Are we still in the? Are you still? Are you you still late seventies now? This is mid seventies. Okay. So so um, um, I lived I lived on the Bowery from about seventy six seventy five seventy six to nineteen eighty, and then in nineteen eighty I moved into uh, where. I'm coming to you from my studio, which is in an 1890 stable that was formerly a, an Italian marble and tile works. And so I'm, and it was built originally as a stable and it was half the roof was gone. It was filled three floors filled to the ceiling with essentially junk that had to be cleared out. No one, no one had ever lived here before other than horses. And uh, so I proceeded with a gut renovation that took only 12 years, but by 10 <laughs> years, I, really cool. I go, hold on, hold on. I've been there a couple of times, a few times. Yes, a couple it, of times. <laughs> it's fantastic. You know, you go into that alley, I forgot the street where you come off. Freeman, and you yes, off Freeman Street. You must have had a lot of scene going on in that little alley because I could see, you know, and I'm not going to go there now, but and finally we find your door. And my God, we come in, and this is a fantastic place. So, anyway, let's you come let's in with my world. <laughs> yeah. So let's go back to what it. And now you've worked on that, but still, can you tell us? And then we'll we'll move to the PSA. But then today we we talked about it. Yesterday, when I talked to you, you were with the Whitney. You were on a Zoom meeting with the Whitney, yes. the producer, and that. So you have your work there. I mean, how many of us have artwork at the Whitney? So what happened? How did you get your way to the Whitney? So um, um, it's an ex exhibition called Around Days In, and it's art from uh, New York City, 1970 through, I think, 1986. And so the work I'm showing is uh, a work on paper from 1975 from a notorious uh, gay club uh, bar that was in the, what was the meatpacking district, that's the west end of 14th Street, which is now an, an elegant boutique uh, couture fashion and food 
and uh, entertainment uh, destination uh, in part, you know, all of Manhattan uh, has been gentrified. And um, so when I made these drawings, starting when I arrived in 1974 through about 1976, so, so I have a portfolio of maybe 80 drawings done over two years. And there were also paintings done during that time. But it's the drawings of this sort of underground life among the gay community here in New York City. And I showed them for the first time in 2013 uh, here in New York at a art fair with a Chicago Gallery Corbett versus Dempsey. And um, they are hands down one of the coolest, hippest galleries in America. And they also produce um, CDs. They have a whole music production uh, arm. Um, and so we also made a book, which was finally published in 2006. Oh, I know. Is that the book you gave me? I have it. Yes. Yes. Oh my God! This is ooh. <laughs> it's, very, uh, it's very strong, and uh, I really like it. It's very, you know, so but I love the work, and it's so much reminiscent of this period, and um, which when I arrived, you know, I arrived in, in the early eighties in, in California, but also New York, San Francisco, where I met right. you, in LA, right? right. And, uh, so that's uh, so I know that period. Not as deep as you, but and I, from that book and from that painting, that drawing, and, and, uh, uh, you, it's, it's fantastic. You, you are able to bring back the feeling of the moment. That was really very, very good. So congratulations again for your Thank weekly you. accomplishment. So you may not be in the Riviera, but you are the weekly. Trust me. <laughs> You're good. So can we go back a little bit to... Uh, not going back, you, we just mentioned it. So here in the 80s, uh, so I'll tell just a little story for the people, and that's a story actually you told, or we talked, you know, at one of the uh, dinner at the National Arts Club at the time that you even gave me an award of some sort. But it was the, the notion that when I arrived in the early 80s, I was here sent by the family, the Senelier family, to conquer America with pastels, you know, soft pastels. And early on in uh, in 80s, I ended up myself on Gramercy Park, which that's where I was staying. I was staying in the old Gramercy Park Hotel when it was a dump upstairs. I had a, a, not a loft, but it was really very bohemian-like and very cheap, believe it or not. And I would stay there, and then I went to the National Hotel, and I met uh, Flora Giuffuni, who had just started I mean, a few years before the Pastel Society of America. And here I was with my, you know, I was like 21 years old, 22 years old with my pastel, I'm trying to understand. And, and she was so passionate about making pastels, you know, a, a strong medium in America. And uh, because pastel was not well recognized, aside from maybe Degas, the ballerinas, pastel was not really recognized as a full painting. And I remember telling her, Laura, we're going to change that. Pastel, it's painting. And now we need to change. We're not drawing with pastel. We are painting with pastels. And together, we made the dare, you know, the pledge to together, we're going to make pastel a real recognized medium. So, and ever since I've tried my best, she did much more than I did. And uh, ever since, and then I've met I've been friends with most of the, or all of the, you know, Pastel Society uh, president, and 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 here you are. So, <laughs> very strong. so why don't you tell us your story about PSA? How did you find yourself at PSA? Um, I started showing with a really established uh, New York gallery around nineteen. Uh, 94 and uh, again serendipity and so it's basically everything good that's happened 
in my art life. Uh, I've been given introductions to this good luck through friends who were artists or through artists who had heard or seen my work. So I was doing very large flower paintings in 1994 and an artist curated the show for a gallery that's now gone called Midtown Payson. Midtown Payson showed artists like Jack Levine, the famous satirist, and Paul Cadmus, also a very famous uh, satirist. And uh, I was included in this very large show. In fact, I was the only artist in the exhibition that didn't have gallery representation. And I was showed with David Hockney and uh, Alex Katz and, and uh, Robert Kushner, who actually put the show together. Uh, Janet Fish, who I know Pierre. Knows. Oh, Janet, good friend. No, you're talking about many friends. You know, I was a personal good friend of Janet and also David Hockney. So we have a few friends in common. Right? Uh, uh, so so uh, at a certain point, uh, the gallery said they kept my work on consignment. Uh, so it was a very informal arrangement. And maybe a year, year and a half went by. And the gallery director said, look, Jimmy, I have to be realistic about this. I'm showing your work more often to clients than I'm showing some of the artists I represent. I'm going to have to start taking 50%. Well, that was how she told me she was representing me. It was entirely business. 50% meant she was represent the gallery Midtown Payson was representing me. So that was the whole beginning of my relationship with, with a real professional, um, they were at Fifth Avenue, right across from Bergdorf Goodman's, uh, an established uh, art gallery. And one of the first things she said to me, she goes, well, you know, your paintings are too big for the average Park Avenue apartment. I need something a collector can take home under their arms. And I'm thinking, I'm not really, I was making really big paintings, six by six feet. And I'm thinking, I'm not really interested in making small paintings. And I had two sets of pastels, uh, a Rembrandt set. Ah, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Kidding. A Rembrandt set and a very small set of Sennelliers. Ah! And that's all I had. And uh, I thought, well, I'm making flowers. I love 18th century, uh, 17th and 18th century botanical drawings, you know, where it's um, scientific observation and let's say it's a wild rose and it's the bloom and a stem, and then maybe there's samples of the leaves, and it's all on a white background. And I thought, I'm gonna do my version of botanical drawings. So I started doing the dried, dead sunflowers that are very distorted and expressionistic as, no. as single blooms on a white background. But in so, pastel, only in pastel? Yes, yes. only in pastel. Okay. And they were on full-size sheets of paper. So, well, they weren't exactly small for a work on paper because most of them were 41 inches by 29 inches. That's sort of an average uh, paper manufacturing size. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so... I thought, oh, I love the feel of fresco and plaster. So I actually, I actually took Reeves BFK, which is a printmaking paper that's very absorbent. And I took another printmaking paper called copper plate and I coated them with gesso. Now I don't mean acrylic gesso, which is a real gesso. I mean real gesso, which is Robert's uh, rabbit skin glue and uh, a white chalk. 
And so these were all uh, stretched on a board, coated, and then when they were coated, I sanded them so that I had a polished white surface, and then I drew on them with pastel. And at a certain point, I took, I took a chamois cloth, <laughs> which is ultra soft, and I just simply whacked the whole drawing with the chamois. That took off three-fourths of the pastel, and what was left was this beautiful, soft ghost of what I had spent hours drawing. <laughs> and then I went back into the ghost, and, and uh, I actually took an eraser and brought out highlights, and then I took this, actually took the Sennelier pastels as final touch-ups, and so I would go on this white, beautiful, shiny surface. There's no tooth to it. Uh, I would go from brilliant white to these very soft, soft ghost colors to details that were intense, rich, full pastel. And uh, we framed them all in white frames. And they actually had uh, four inch mats all the way around and then white frames. Um, the, and actually one of the gallery directors um, who sort of steered me to a particular frame, uh, which I've now learned from designers uh, uh, is, is the kind of frame that goes both in a traditional interior, but it also goes in a modern uh, contemporary interior. And now all these years later, I'm still using the same white frame, but I've eliminated the mat and the frame itself functions like a mat. So, so there's concentration, the pastel is there. Uh, it's more like a painting now. Uh, the whole surface, as you see behind me, this big poppy, poppy painting, the whole surface is colored in pastel. Uh, and then that would go in a white frame um, right up and over the edge of, of the piece. Um, Okay, so, so and, uh, and, everyone loves the story, it, and they'd like to see. Us. Do you have some of them in your studio? <laughs> well, all you're going to get to see is behind me. <laughs> but yeah, it was right. He, what he said was going to have a, a, a thing to show, but uh, it work out. But I'd like to go back to a couple of things. One is now I remember. I'm sorry, it's, it's personal, but you know, this is a discussion. You know, we, it's like a party. We can chat on even personal things. Now I remember. Didn't we met at Janet Fisher's in Soho in the early 90s. Yes, because I showed in the same, Janet also showed at Midtown Payson. So Janet and her husband, Charles Parnes, yeah. threw a big party. And I was a guest and you were a guest. Yeah, that and was that so was, funny. That was truly an old fashioned loft. Charles yeah. had to come down in the freight elevator to pick us up from the ground floor yeah, but the and diamond. operate the elevator. It yeah. actually looked like the old elevator at the National Arts Club. Very uh, similar. You know, my friend uh, who passed away, unfortunately, Cristo, had a similar type of setting yes. Grand Street uh, across, uh, no, not very far, very close to, to Janet. And uh, uh, unfortunately, passed away. But same thing, you have to ring. I remember to see her. I, I had to, at some point, I had to call from the diner. I remember at some point, there was yes. no cell phone. There's a diner. We have to go to the diner, call on the, on the, floor. To the diner, and then she would come down, or Charles would come down on the freight elevator, and there was that big steel door, like it looks like a, like a, like a tanker. I mean, it was like, wow. It was surreal. And here we are. Isn't it funny? How, that was before PSA. You are not... I mean, you were maybe right. Remember. That is, I. It was a few years later. I showed in one of the annuals, not knowing what I was showing in, except I had gotten really involved in making a lot of past only pastels. I was so I was doing oil. It's the same thing I'm doing now. I was making big oil paintings, and I was doing smaller scale pastels. And so 
I don't even recall how I learned about this exhibition, but I entered and was accepted. And that was, uh, that would have been in towards the late nineties, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and I met Flora for the first time. I actually went to, I think I won an award and I went to the banquet and this is when, uh, this is old school National Arts Club. Uh, people were not very friendly. Uh, I sat at a table that was almost all empty and, I, and my dinner companion that they paired me with, there were only two of us at the table and the other person was an alcoholic. <laughs> but it was so different. It was, it was bizarre. Yeah. It was a but bizarre now, but, but let, let's do a fast forward because I have a little thing for you. You know, yeah. to, that's kind of interesting. Now, when we have dinner, which I'm very fortunate that you invite me often to your the presidential table, and now it's a National Arts Club that has been renovated some, still in his old thing and there's a new new management it's a fantastic place and now every time it's full all your dinner whatever you do it's full and last time it, 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 it well every time i meet the most amazing people at your table and uh, but one in particular last time and i know i don't want to talk politics but i remember i was sitting introduced me to uh, the mother of uh, andrew uh, Yang. Yang, and uh, she's a pastelist. Yes. Every time I meet, and what was the name of, of the, oh, her name just, um, Angela's you, mother. You, um, you sat with, I don't, you sat with uh, Diane Bernhardt one year. Yes. Uh, but Nancy us. Yang, Nancy Yang is who you're thinking of, uh, the mother of, of the um, presidential candidate for uh, Andrew Yang, yes. Yeah, and we had a friend. So now, whatever when you were there, like now you made it much more. Now you know when I walk there, I feel like a rock star with all those celebrities. So you <laughs> made you and your predecessor brought up PSA, and it's a celebration. Uh, I remember I used to go uh, just to the fair, to the material fair on Saturday. And on Sunday, I would be off somewhere, you know, either back to San Francisco, I would go on the Hamptons or Vermont, whatever. And now, but the last few years, at least since you were the president, now I don't miss the dinner ever. And it's so much <laughs> fun. And, uh, and, and you, 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 you're bringing, not to take anything away from the previous president, they all contributed a great deal and all with so much passion. But I have to admit, it feels to me you brought it to another level. And in fact, you know, I was very touched when you invited me to be part of the advisory board, trying to open up, uh, you know, and you said, you told me something that I would like to talk about this a little bit, because you talk often, if I may, and tell me if it's not a good conversation, but, you know, one of the things that we have in common, we have many, many things in common, but, you know, this love of art, of the great art, the high art, and all that. And, you told me, you know, sometimes people forget it's a pastel society, it's a medium, it's not a genre. And you were telling me as much as you have amazing art, you know, great technique, you have, you, your show are fantastic, but it's mostly of one kind of genre and the idea to promote pastel as a mainstream, high art, contemporary art and get the young involved and all that. And I'm really working on that. And in fact, I'll tell you my thing. Can you talk about that, about your philosophy, or how you how you like to see the, the society and the pastel world evolve? Well, you know, uh, it's a medium society. Pastel is, is a medium. And so um, I can remember this was a discussion when I first became a board member and they were uh, uh, during applications for membership one of the older members was sort of pulling his hair out. Everything we looked at was like a formal social portrait. And, and uh, this artist was saying, we're not the portrait society. And 
And it's the realization, we're not the landscape society, we're not the realist society, we're, we're not the uh, animal portrait society, we are the pastel society. And that includes artists like uh, uh, board member Arlene Richmond, who does abstracts, or it includes uh, Brian Bailey, who does these beautiful, romantic, very realist uh, figure studies. Uh, it's so, still a minority. They're still very small compared, no? but it's growing. What's what's a, what's I you missed me? What's a growth? Well, I said you have included and you have on your board a few abstract or, or non-representatives, but I'm saying it's still a very small minority, right? Uh, um, currently, yes, abstraction is very much a small minority. And, and there's a reason for that, because young artists who, who are engaged with abstract painting, and this is true of most young artists, there's been a whole shift in how, edu how art is taught and how, what it means. Uh, and it used to be when I went to school in the 60s and taught in the 70s, the painting department and the sculpture departments ruled the roost. They were the most important departments. They had the most money. They had the most important artists and they were the most aggressive and visible. So when, when um, Flora founded the Pastel Society in 1972 in New York in the 70s and I arrived, uh, uh, I arrived two years later, all one saw in New York art galleries were painting and sculpture and the beginnings of conceptual art. So I also was seeing of what we now would call avant-garde video art. So the same revolution was taking place in art schools. Many other media were being introduced as a vehicle not to render a realistic painting, but to render an idea. And so now in 2020, we're very much involved in a time when social activism and environmental issues, racial inequality, all things that perhaps a, a great artist like Jack Levine and Paul Cadmus would address yeah. through realism, you're now seeing it addressed through performance artists, uh, video art, uh, installations. You know, it's sort of like blown, blown the art world apart. So that's why you go into a modern museum. You have no idea what you're going to see. Yeah. And, and but, but so, so you mean I find this that very exciting. But to introduce pastel now to younger artists, they already have to be interested in, in certain aspects of pastel. So I came with a very deep background in printmaking. Well, that involves a love of paper. And Pierre, don't you represent Fabriano? Yes, 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 Fabriano. And I'm working on Fabriano, the new paper for you, because I know you like, you like, you know, you mentioned another brand earlier, I'm going to repeat it, but I'm going to get you even a better one, and I'm working on it. But uh, we don't just realize the time. Yes. We have only uh, uh, five, ten minutes left, oh, so we're going to have... I want to show you something. I, I want to show you something. Hours. So, Look at this. Uh, we have some uh, interesting thing. Look Since at this. We have any question? One second. Do you have any question? Do we have the giveaway? Do you want to say something? Well, it sounds like everybody loves the stories. Wow, look at the uh, so. giant pastels. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted uh, to show you my set of giant pastels. Okay, so go ahead. We'll, we'll go back. Go, go ahead. Uh, well, I, yeah, we want to give some, we want to give some of those away yes. to uh, yes. a lucky winner. And this week's yes. winner is Adrian F. Giuliani. Oh, Adrian! Do you know her? I do. But well, so congratulations. Please, uh, please direct message us your uh, mailing address, and we could get those uh, pastels to you. Yeah. So I have a little story to say because uh, Jimmy is showing the set. So I have a little story to tell you quickly. Uh, 
one of the time I came to his studio and I saw his amazing uh, studio. Maybe when you leave, before you leave, if you can take your phone and show your studio. It's amazing. But w wait a minute. Wait a minute. Okay. So I have to still have... A million pastels. And then he said, Pierre, I have something to show you. And he shows me that set he just showed of the giant pastel that he got in Paris and saying, oh, but we cannot find them here. It's true. We cannot. <laughs> But I'm not very good at this. <laughs> yes, I bought that at, at the Sonnelier store in probably uh, 1999. But show your table, show your table with all the pastels. Well, I'm having, uh, I can't tell what you... Uh, oh, no. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Uh, he lost me. Oh, there you go. Oh, we lost you for a second. Hello? Sorry. I'm sorry, folks. I'm on this iPad, and it's not very... Uh, hey, so I have a question for you. Hey, when you have a chance, show your table. But here, since I... So can I uh, show... A, uh, can I do a, an abstract and present it? Absolutely. So I'm going to start doing pastel for you and try to enter the show. Okay, and I'll use those pastels. What's the paper? I guess a couple of questions in here, actually. Yeah, so Cindy has okay. questions for you. Go ahead while I paint. Somebody was asking if these large pastels are still available. So the answer is yes and no. Right now, they're officially available only when you go to the Sennelier store in Paris. That is a special make. But occasionally, we do a special promotion and the last time was with PSA we did an exclusive PSA uh, set last year and we're probably gonna do but I cannot talk about it but for the next PSA if you come to the PSA in September in New York we'll have a surprise for you meanwhile if you really want it you can reach out to me Pierre at savoirfaire.com and I could maybe help you but no they're not available uh, uh, the other question was uh, they have one of those large pastels in two different colors. Is that available? A pa pastel with two colors and the same pastel? No. I guess so. Well, no, no, not really. No. no. No, no, it's not. It's only one color. But sometimes the big pastels, the pigment can change and it can have, it looks like two different colors. So oh, I'm asking if the giants have two colors in one stick are still available. No. No, those are not. It's not. It's only one color per stick. Is so, Pierre? Is there a medium sized stick? Yes, we have. We call it le grand. Le, le the, grand. So we have. Now we have the half stick, the full stick, the grand, and the giant. We have four sizes. And the grand, you can find it. I think the grand, you can find it to some of those uh, either. Uh, Dakota or Rochester Art, they offer with special order for them. They're the only two places you can find them. And you can reach out to us, but they are available in uh, uh, in America. And, you know, Rochester is the person who comes, he has another name, also fine art, something. Uh, he, he comes every year at the at the show at the National Arts Club. And at, he, to the material fair, yes. Yeah. And he comes. So I want to show he, you something. This is this is the current regular size uh, Sennelier. Pierre, look at this. This is the original size. Look how how thin this is. Do you remember these? Yeah, this yeah, is yeah, yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> so I'll tell so, you about that. It's me. It's it's me that have asked. You know, to increase, we ask, we increase two millimeters, two or three millimeters, you know, in order to be a little thicker so we could, uh, it doesn't break. And also there was a competition that was bigger and I couldn't, I didn't like that. So I want to be as big. So, <laughs> yeah. but show it next to the giant. No, show it to one of the giant and the, and the old one. Show, show the difference. Oh, we have another question. I okay, have, I'm new to pastels and I notice a few different numbers have the same color name. Why is that? The what? Which pastels? Some of the pastels have the same color name, but they're different on different numbers. Oh, it's because when we make pastels, I have to think. 
So the way we make pastel, the Sennelier pastel are 100% pure pigment with just uh, some water that dries and a little bit of gum dry icon, nothing else. Okay, that's the pure, we call it the head tone. And then we degrade to the same as the head tone, the pure, the pure color. And then we add a little bit of chalk. It's a very pure chalk from Champagne. That's how we have graduation. So you could have up to nine graduation. It's the same color of a different, but with white chalk. That's what we call the, the pastel. That's what actually it's called pastels. You know, when, when it graduates with chalk. But, uh, so that's why we do the same color on um, up to nine different, you could have nine different numbers for one color. But a different value. Sennelier is here. You can agree, I think. Uh, oh, says. Yves Marie! Woo! It's very late. Bonjour, Yves Marie. How are you? Do you guys know Yves Marie? He's the, the, the face of Sennelier in, uh, you know, he's in charge of all the social media, the art director of Sennelier, and you should follow him. He's, he's a lot of fun. And he, he's uh, Yves Marie from Yves Marie Calenso. He said something? He said uh, the same pigment with different shade of white. Is yep. his answer. Yep. Okay. Wow. Oh, thank God we had the same answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've got only a few minutes so left. We might minutes. kick us off. So, uh, Jimmy, you yes. have the last word. So, tell us a word of wisdom <laughs> that would help us to go through this crazy time and how through art with pastel we're going to become gonna come out of it stronger and, uh, well, and on your way out can you show a photo i mean a photo can you show your, your table with the million pastels well i don't quite know how to do it but we can you take your phone and take it in your hand i well it's in the stand i can't see if you're seeing it can you see it uh, cindy me i can can you yeah, see i can't hold on i have a different view right now and I don't want to mess it up. I don't. Yes, we can see. Hold on. Ah. Yeah, that gives us an idea. We can move, move around. Yeah, we can see. Move around, right, left, just to get a feel. It's crazy. So, uh, yeah, move, move a little bit behind. But anyway, we we, we got the Lower. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> And we get the gist of it. So come, come back. We need to see your face. And you said the last word before I say everybody to go paint. Uh, so if you're uninspired, clean your <laughs> pastels. <laughs> All right, hey, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you. I love you. And thank you for coming in. I'm, I'm sure people were very happy to see you. And thank you for everything you do for the art world, for the pastel world, for New York. You are the man. That's usually what I said to Richard McKinley, but today you are the man. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys because probably in one Thanks. minute or well. two, we may get cut off. So we can continue. But uh, thank you, Jimmy. And I'll talk to you. And I can't wait to see your new uh, pastelogram, which um, I decided to help you with. So. Uh, when is it coming out? When is your pastelogram coming out? December or January. We've, we've had so much work to do getting the administrative part of PSA to function from our administrator Cindy's office in Queens that we, we had many more chores this year. And so pastelogram kept being pushed forward. So now we're, we're just starting to work on the issue. And it's going to be on realism. And the question is, what is realism now? Realism, what is it now? Yeah, and I know, I, and I have part of the answer, but I won't say it because I'm treating you to a, 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 a secret. So get it, whoever is not a member, get a member, get your wiki. It, it, it. Only members get the pastel gram? Only the That's PSA correct. members? Or how do you get the pastel gram? Well, you, you uh, apply for membership to the society. It's one okay. of the benefits of joining. And then about six months after it's been published, and we, we do hard copies mailed to every um, artist member, 
Um, about six months later, nine months later, we put it on our webpage as a PDF flipbook. All right. And you can so, actually uh, go on the webpage now and see past year's issues uh, of Pastelogram. Uh, there's a great one on the entire issue is on artists using photography. And it's one of my favorite issues. So, right. so uh, on that note, everybody should go. I mean, not everybody. People who are interested in Pastel, please join uh, PSA. It's a fantastic organization. It's a lot of fun. And Jimmy, wait! I can't wait to come to see you in New York, and we can have a we can hang out in your loft again, and and, uh, and at the National Arts Club. So I look uh, forward to when we can all socialize together, and we can have the annual in the Grand Gallery of the National Arts Club, and we can all have a drink in the dining room or a fabulous uh, banquet together or just sitting in the living, the parlors of the National Arts Club. Yeah. So I look it's forward to it. You guys don't miss it. But you know, since we have time, you know, we can continue to chat. Usually Instagram shut us off, but today they, they decided to give us a little extra. Mm -hmm. So we could do shout out the time. So yeah. what I'll say, and we can continue to talk, I said, go pastels. Usually I say, go straight as go pastel. So, Something I wanted to talk since we have extra time. We're talking about Marjorie Shelley. So Marjorie Shelley, not only she's the creator of work on paper and work in pastel for the Met, especially the 18th century, you know, the French, uh, uh, very famous at the time, but she's also the head of the conservation department of all work on paper at the Met. And uh, we've talked a lot with her and others, and she we got the confirmation and I had it double check also with my friend at the National Gallery, who is the head of conservator there. And pastel is the most archival color that exists. So, you know, pastel, Marjorie, she come and take me and go to the Met, go and look at this 18th century portrait on pastel. They, they were not restored. They looks, it looks like they were painted yesterday. You don't varnish, you don't restore the color, the pastel doesn't move. Of course, you have to keep it in the dark, not full sun and all that. And that's a, a mindset because pastel is fragile, people think, but it is officially the most archival color. It's, it's almost like you can go in Lascaux Caves, you have sort of kind of pastel that are 20,000 years old. So I want to people to remember that, and especially in this time of digital world where everything is on TV, on phone, on computer, we're going back to touch and feel. And I tell you, there's nothing more sensual, you know, than a pure pigment. Look, you know, get your hand dirty. You get the full, is that the, the real, the real stuff, you know? You can play, get dirty, and you get the real, real, real color. And so only Pierre, can deliver the 100% pure pigment from, you know, and you can see it sparkle, the pigment sings to you, right? Pierre, the most important thing then, the pastel is permanent. You want to be sure you're painting on a ground, meaning a paper or a canvas that is 100% acid free so that the paper doesn't deteriorate. So when you're at the Metropolitan and you walk into a room that's dimly lit and it's all Degas pastels, it's dimly lit because the paper that Degas worked on was not 100% acid free. The paper is fragile and the paper is particularly sensitive to light. And the same thing uh, in all the great museums uh, the other reason they're so overprotected is uh, none of the 18th century pastels are fixed. There was no fixative on them. So can you imagine the Louvre will not loan a pastel from the 18th century to the Metropolitan Museum in New York because they're fearful of its being jarred or dropped during transport. And yep. that's why we think of, that's why pastels are thinking of, uh, are spoken of as being delicate. It's not the pigment that's delicate. It's, it's the paper or the surface that it's painted on. No, no, I, I know that, but I had to, to say, because people 
confused, you are 100% correct, obviously. You know what you're talking about. Uh, but people make connections. In fact, there is a, a story that pastel became more popular when we were able to have flat glass, when we can do... Oh, yes. Glass, because you can frame with glass. So that was a breakthrough for pastel. But yes, yeah, today, It was also a sign of wealth to have a piece of plate glass. Pastels were very expensive. And that's when pastels became equal to painting. It cost as much because you had to have plate, a sheet of plate glass. This, was, this is why only the emperor of, of France uh, lived in a palace and all the uh, nobility lived in palaces with great sheets of plate glass. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have the, as far as stories like that, I have a, it's, it applies more to oil uh, of the time. It's that, you know, on the pigment back in the Renaissance and, and after even the Dutch painter, you know, in the uh, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century, you know, you had never blue. You can find a good blue. Only lapis lazuli was a patch of fortune. And people, uh, to have blue, to own a painting with blue was a sign of wealth. So yes. the more blue you had on your painting, the richer you were. <laughs> so that's how people measure the wealth of the different you know, kings or things. It was how much blue they had on their painting. That's sort of interesting. But to go back to your point, it's essential. The paper, the surface is essential. So first of all, yes, acid-free, but you need to have a paper that has a little bit of tooth or, or, or coating or something where the pastel can be grabbed. You know, we have here, the, you know, I'm, I'm being playing here which is a new version, and that's a, a surprise for Richard McKinley. I finally developed the lacquer, which is made out of uh, cork, it's cork uh, dust, if you will. But you always have a challenge because we couldn't find an archival glue that would provide that. So that's why our uh, archival waterproof glue. But we finally found a way. So this is the first sheet of the fully waterproof lacquer paper, which... What's the dimensions of the paper? Yeah, this is... Yeah, uh, how, big a, how big a sheet? No, right now, the one I have, it's only like 22 by 30 or something. But I know you, I already plan to have some special order uh, larger, because you're not the only Yay! one. <laughs> so I know you. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to forget about you. So I'm working on my abstract painting. I'm I'm hoping to uh, make the cut next next uh, next September. Oh, there it is. He has the pastels now. He's showing them in his studio. Ah, he's moving. Okay, <laughs> better than, than mine. Awesome. And one of my models, a dried sunflower. <laughs> so what you're seeing is assortment of almost every brand made. Oh, come on, you told me you were using exclusively only Sennelier's. Oh, you're breaking my mouth. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. No, I welcome you know, every pastel. This is, my, uh, this is my designer closet. <laughs> and these are all my designer clothes. Uh, but of course, the most valuable are the Sennelier's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, you know I, I, have, I have so much fun. You know, another, I'm sorry, I'm talking about my some of my late friends another friend that passed two I had two very important friends that helped me uh introduce me to the world of pastel was uh it was uh, daniel green you know who who as again 22 years old he took me under his wing and really helped me selling my set of 525 and i remember telling his student you got to have that full set if you want to be a real pastelist and people had to show up in his class with those set of 552 colors. And then my other friend, which was a studio that looks like yours, is Wolf Kong. Wolf Kong yes. was the one who actually talked to me, told me about the Rocher pastels, and he had that, and Sennelier, and he had also, like you, all the brands. You would go into the studio, in, I think he was in Chelsea, um, before Chelsea became a, an artist uh, hub, and my God, and I, it was the first time I met someone who had so many pastels, 
and he walked me through it. And every, I spent hours in his studio and uh, he was, he taught me about pastel. He taught me about all the brands and why certain brands was better for the color, the texture, the size, the shape, the thickness, the softness, the grit. You know, it's amazing. And often I say, you know, the pastel artists are art supply junkies. Sorry for the thing, because when you're a pastel artist, you can never have enough pastel, enough paper, enough of all those things. So, so uh, beer, when I work and I pick up, uh, say I'm using a red, and I pick up a Sennelier red, I know exactly how it's going to go onto the painting. And I know how it's going to go on the painting if it's the first color. And I know how it's going to be go on the painting if it's going other all over other pastels or another color. So each brand, you have trade secrets. Each brand has its own formula, and and they react differently when you're working with them. And so that's why that's why an artist ends up with such a giant selection. Yeah, and there's different. There, there is there are a few. You know, it, it's like it's a free world. There's a few artists who work differently. They have a very selective set. They have one, you know, they work with 100 colors. But uh, but in most cases, it's more like you, yeah. If you can afford it and to collect. And, and the good thing is pastel don't turn bad. You know, as we, you remember when we were at the Met with the set we, we got? You have a 120 years old pastels and it works like yesterday. So you don't have to worry. Yes. Uh, just yes. keep them safe. So, my God, so, so you got... You know, you have that magic thing. Do you have stock in Instagram, <laughs> Jimmy? What did you? <laughs> Instagram makes an exception for you. <laughs> uh, you have secret. So on that note, we got a lot of bonus and extra, but I think we should maybe slowly finish. Unless you have other questions, Cindy, coming up or? Um, no. Somebody asked if um if we can use pastel on Fabriano paper, and of course. Yes, so Fabriano paper. So if you want to use pastel or Fabriano, uh, the the one that are most uh, you talk, I would recommend three different kind of paper from Fabriano. One, you have the Tiziano, which is kind of the equivalent as the more entry level for students for little sketch. It would be equivalent to Mita, uh, and that's you know with cotton, but it's inexpensive. I read, I recommend more the hundred percent cotton mold made. Because there is a better feel, you know, better touch, a better hand to it, and then you can go two direction, like Jimmy to use uh, printmaking that doesn't have any sizing, so it's a little toothy, no texture, but uh, with a mini tooth, and that would be Tiepolo, or you could go with an Artistico, which is a watercolor paper, and then uh, that I would recommend to probably follow uh, Jimmy's idea to put a little bit of some kind of ground. You know, there's a few company that do grounds that you can apply. It's kind of a gesso type, but specialized for pastels. Uh, oh, yeah. That would be my recommendation. But then after- This is your pastel. ground. This is your ground for pastel. All right, does it work? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's- uh, See, it, I took a chance. Says, uh, Pierre's Sennelier ground is white. So you're putting a white ground on and it has a very fine tooth to it. Uh, and then of course, the other one that I use is uh, golden. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is really, this is really just um, uh, matte medium with pumice. Yeah. Uh, but I like the prepared grounds because then I don't have to mix them. So, um, uh, and they're totally consistent. So, so uh, any other question? Or, or we have continued to paint, look. look Jimmy, how. we have a question from Carol. Do you do your art on the wall in Freeman's Alley? No. <laughs> no, what you see on Freeman's Alley, on Freeman Alley uh, are paste ups. Uh, those are all much younger artists. Um, the paste-ups are either printed through uh, digital prints 
or some of them are uh, actual woodcuts. Uh, some are hand painting, painted. I, you know, I, I see artists pasting up drawings uh, in Freeman Alley. So it's a whole wide range, but those are all much younger artists. And there's a real art to being able to paste on a brick wall. Uh, it's so, quite physical. <laughs> so Freeman Alley, is that the alley that leads to your place? Yes. Yeah, that's the yes. alley I was referring to. So those today, there is this kind of art. In the past, there was other thing going on there, but that would be for next, that would be in private conversation with a glass that of wine. That would be the oldest art. <laughs> <laughs> Eve Marie says, wonderful artwork by Peter. Congratulations. <laughs> Who said that? Eve Marie. Ah. <laughs> Hypnotic. The artist. Look. There you go. Look at Beautiful. that. <laughs> And he also said, uh, oh, and he also made the recommendation that we could uh, add color to the ground. Yes. So there yes. is, yeah, I, I was thinking of that. If Marie is correct, that a lot of people in pastels rather start from a, a, a background, a darker background. So um, people think that they have to do watercolor or gouache or something over to prepare their, their background. But if Marie is right. Yeah, so well, your base, your base is acrylic. So acrylic paint would be how you would add color. Yeah, yeah. So you would add yeah. uh, acrylic color in the gesso, which is acrylic based, which is a right. uh, acrylic gesso, not the real gesso that we make. And yeah, so Ima is right. Yeah, you could, you know, it's, it's white, but you don't have to use it white. You can right. color. Right. Alexandra so, said, "Love the frame." Ah. My friend, yeah, well, just to fake it. So, um, hey, tell me if I want to enter for the. Should I come up? If I come, if I want to show a, a abstract painting for the PSA, should I not use my name? Because you know, I, I'm not. Should I use a, a different name? I, no? I think you have a very distinctive style. That is your signature. <laughs> True. I cannot describe myself. So what's going on? Instagram is still on. So what are the votes? I want to see oh. some thumbs up. Should we stop or should we continue? Oh, it looks like it's spinning it's, now. Oh. Bye, guys. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank Go you. Go mm, Love you. Bravo. Happy Halloween. <laughs>